Okay, perfect. Um, so, um, Carla, uh, <laughs> uh, it's good to have you. And um, I haven't had this opportunity to to talk to someone about the, the topic that we are going to talk about. Um, and it's really good to have you because you obviously have a first-hand knowledge about, about all the things. Um, but I think it's better if we uh, directly go into uh, what your project is about and where you come from, and uh, then we'll go on from there. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Ash, yeah. for the invitation. I'm also very happy to be here talking to you. I think we already had some interesting conversations around the same topic and we didn't record by the time, so I'm glad that we are doing this here. So yes, I'm Carla. I'm the founder of an organization called Project Tres. So we are a nonprofit organization. And the focus of our work is with women in India and Kenya that came from different backgrounds, but especially women that um, experienced some sort of vulnerability, being that financially, emotionally, or physically. And the approach that we follow in Project Trace is to contribute for these women to become financially and emotionally independent through skills training, education, and personal development programs. Um, I think this is something that sounds a bit simple, depending on the place in the world you are. But when we are talking about um, countries in the global south, that's not so typical. We have a lot of projects that are focused on handcraft skills, which is also a part of the work we do in our organization. But when it comes into personal development and this slow process of investing in every and each woman so they can really break the cycle, um, it's something we haven't really seen. Um, mm -hmm. I come originally from Brazil, uh, which is a country that has also a similar historic uh, background as India and Kenya, of course, in different levels. Yeah. Um, so that's why I decided to put this work together. Okay. So um, when you started off with uh, the project, like what was going through your mind uh, when you decided to to start off something like that? Um, I just believed like this. This is an idea that, first of all, my background is in fashion design. So I used to work um, in luxury in Brazil. And there was a point in my career where I started questioning a lot, like why things are done the way they are done, why the people are responsible for making things, they are so disconnected from the whole process, like they are made uh separated from the stuff that they produce you know they are taught just a very small part of the production chain so everything is started more from this like handicraft and um handmade aspect of things and making products and production chain and after questioning this but not having very much a clarity i started thinking that maybe i wanted to use these skills i had from fashion in a way that I could pass on to people. Mm -hmm. um, how could they make this differently? How could they make products and understand the whole process, including pricing, including quality control, including um, selling, which are parts which usually when we are talking about supply chain are completely removed from the people producing. And I would say that this is where the whole idea started from. And on a more personal level, besides that, I had also a history of uh, domestic violence myself. So I experienced a lot of domestic violence uh, during my whole childhood and a lot of emotional uh, violence through my teenage years because of my father. And until that point in time, uh, this was something I could not really... Uh, make peace with it you know I'm not saying this to say that people have to be responsible for the trauma they're exposed to but to me I knew that this trauma was not serving me in any way and I would like to try to 
kind of experiment with it because I said, yeah, it's something it's going to be there anyway. So maybe I just use this for some people that went through similar stuff and yeah. let's see what we can create together. Do you do you still have uh, do you still despise uh, your childhood or, or are you are you over it now? I think it's still a work in progress. Like I think I have come a long way. And for example, I made a lot of peace with my father and with the things I went through. It's not that I really suffer from this anymore. And I think um, taking myself from the central position and seeing that other people also go through this and that life is a bit more complicated that we can actually explain yeah. was really good. You know, I think that for a very long time, I was still um, very attached to the things I went through and they were defining me and defining how I would navigate through life. And I think when I decided to look into this as a, a kind of a skill, I felt way more free, you know, mm -hmm. and it also contributed for others to feel the same with their processes so yeah I think it's it's always ongoing but I feel pretty good uh, regarding that at the moment yeah um okay um so we we have this we are having this conversation right now because um I am working on something which is close to what what you you have been doing for so long um and I'm still having conversations discussions about this but what is decolonization and how would you describe it and um what role are you playing as an ngo um in that entire process or or just having a debate about it in a place like germany for example yes just so for some background uh, nowadays i'm based in germany in berlin where our organization is uh, registered. So right now I live in the global north. I live in Europe, which is a very different uh, experience than the time I lived in Brazil, the time I lived in India and in Kenya. Decolonization, I think it's an exercise. That's how I would describe at least, because mm -hmm. I don't think we can fully undo what was done mm -hmm. and I think that's why so many people are so resistant to the idea of the colonization or they even think like yeah but not everything can be colonization's fault well, you know mm -hmm. we don't know how the world would be if this haven't happened and like yes that's exactly the point we wouldn't so the way how I see the colonization is like this constant exercise of removing yourself and your beliefs that have been imprinted, especially by European and uh, North American, uh, speaking about uh, the United States, um, into other countries, especially countries and and people and cultures that have been exploited in terms of um, work, in terms of resources, uh, in terms of uh, culture itself. You so, know. Sorry, sorry to cut you, but um, how would you describe uh, the term third world and first world in this discussion then? I'm also a bit critical of this of this term, but but I don't even know how to to really explain that. But yeah, first world is technically these countries that have more economical power, right? And third world are these countries that are perceived as less powerful economically, um, mm -hmm. even though they have the resources, uh, they are perceived as poor because they don't have necessarily money right mm -hmm. or capital mm -hmm. um i think it's a, a wrong term anyways and the way how i usually use to name it is like global north and global south and not even that sometimes i feel completely comfortable about it you know it's just this 
yeah, it's this whole exercise, as I told you, like of mm -hmm. trying to understand this relationship between who was exploited and who exploited. Mm -hmm. And I think it's to talk about the colonization requires a lot of courage and not a lot of people are willing to do that because we are all in one way or the other colonizers. Mm -hmm. You know, we, even if we come from countries that have been colonized, we also have the power to colonize and patronize others. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm from Brazil. I went to another country. Um, I don't feel um, I don't identify as a white woman when I'm in the context of Europe, but mm -hmm. I know that I'm a white woman when I'm in the context of India and Kenya. So it's always like this whole exercise of like understanding a bit more your privileges and not feeling so sensitive about the whole thing because it is a very big problem and we are all part of it. Yeah, so uh, so you were talking about... Uh, um about being being white in places like India and Kenya and and how um how it is exactly so i think that it starts with you making peace with the privileges you have mm -hmm. and not being so sensitive about because yes every and each of us in one level or the other we have privileges even if we come from backgrounds you know that are less privileged than the ones we are exposed now like I am less privileged when I look into the context of Europe, but it's still more privileged because I am white when I am in India and Kenya, mm -hmm. you know, and I experience that and I benefit from that. Mm -hmm. And ignoring this or acting as this doesn't play a role, just keeps this whole system perpetuating. You know, just keeps this whole system of like, yeah, nothing of this is my problem, right? So there is nothing I can really do. And um, and this is where I think that the whole decolonization aspect uh, comes into place. And in the context of Project 3, the way how we try to do this is by exercising our ability to interfere the least possible with the wishes uh, from the women we work with. Mm -hmm. And to do that is not so simple because many of them, they're also not so used to have this power. Yeah. So it's not just about asking people what do they want, you know? Yeah. It's about asking what they want, giving them space, mm -hmm. you know, and, and investing on that, like on a long run. Mm -hmm. And um, I have one example of something that happened in our organization recently that was as an organization, like our team and the volunteers and the yeah. person that works with me, Amanda, we truly believe in mental health. It's something that um, it's very popular internationally. Of course, in the countries we operate, they are a little bit more of a taboo and people don't necessarily have exposure to that. So we have started a mental health program a while ago, like during COVID. Mm -hmm. We first said, we think it's a good idea. What, how do you feel about it? They said they would like to try. They, they started. And especially in India, we had some changes in the whole team doing the mental health program. So we had a change in the therapist and stuff like that. And at some point, the women didn't feel connected anymore. And they didn't want to continue this program. But for us as an organization, this was a very important program, right? It was something very easy to explain to donors internationally was seen in a very positive way. But mm -hmm. we had to prioritize them and what they felt was right at that moment. And we had to, con to actually completely cancel this program for a couple of months. This was quite recent. Mm -hmm. and we told them if you don't feel that this is useful for you we don't have to do it you mm -hmm. know there is no what do you feel it's more useful and they were like yeah we are more into yoga now and meditation now and it took them also a while until they really came and spoke about it and this like we have a very close relationship right when we are talking about India I lived in India for two years like I, I know every and each person that we work with 
I'm very personally close to every each of them. And can you, still can there we is talk this... about can we talk about how it started, how the journey started in India, how you how you came here, how you lived here? I think I I must have met you when you were there for the first time or or maybe second time, some something like that. Um yeah, I think we met during the second time and India was something that, as I said, initially I come from Brazil. I lived most of my life in Brazil. And when I was about 24, I started having a career crisis. And at the time I had a friend living in the US and this friend said to me, oh, why don't you come here to learn English and think about your life. I help you to find a volunteering job. And I decided to do that. So I quit my job and I went there to, to do this. I never left Brazil before. I couldn't speak English by the time. And during this time, I had this whole idea of like, yeah, maybe I want to put my skills at use, being from my work experience, being from my trauma experience. And then I got to this overall concept of Project Tres, and I started making some necklaces out of wood that I found at the streets. And for some reason, I had this idea that like this would work. And I said, yeah, I will just tell people that I'm gonna sell these necklaces when I have $1,500, I'm gonna move to India. Mm -hmm. Because I read an article at the time that said that in some places in India, uh, a girl would be worth less than a cow. And mm. it's like, it never left my mind because I thought it cannot be like this. I think it's exaggerated. Superficial, yeah. Yeah. But I was like, still, I think I, I want to go there. And yeah, and that was my brilliant plan. So I went with a one-way ticket to India in 2015. It, it worked. I did. <laughs> it worked. Spoiler, I'm here. No. <laughs> uh, in 2015, and I literally walked around the streets and asked if someone knew a person that, you know, was struggling. And mm. I was always very clear with the thing that, like, I'm looking for only one person. It's not like a lot of people try to put me down, like, this is not going to work. Are you crazy? Yeah. You're a foreigner. And at some point, I was like, yeah, I'm not trying to change the whole world you know i'm looking for one person like and i'm i'm sure there is one person that is also looking for me and we are gonna find each other mm -hmm. and we did so this person is farida that you know in person yeah <laughs> and farida she's one of my best friends she's my partner in the work we do nowadays she is the president of the NGO we have registered in india mm -hmm. and she's the biggest yeah inspiration i i have in my life i think my two biggest inspirations are my mom and farida and and this is how we actually started you know so for, first farida was learning how to make these necklaces and i was telling her story internationally a bit and we ended up getting other women involved and we saw that just the necklaces would not work so we started making other products Mm -hmm. So it was a long process. Like I said, I opted for living in the country for long. So I had to obviously also leave for visa reasons, like go and come back. Yeah. Yeah. But but the whole idea was to do something very organically and understanding what is that they really need, you know. Mm -hmm. So I also lived in Farida's house for almost a month to observe her relationship mm -hmm. with her kids, her dynamics in the house and these two not come up with solutions for stuff she doesn't need, you know? So mm -hmm. I was like, I cannot propose solutions for things I don't understand. And the only way I can understand is if I see your life, Yeah, you know? So yeah. I was living with them and I tried to do this as much as possible with all the other women as well, you know? Mm -hmm. So really seeing like, what is it difficult? What is it? that they are, they have more um, talent navigating. What is it a struggle to them? What is it not? You know, what, what they can actually manage by themselves, like that they don't need anyone from the outside um, mm -hmm. supporting them, you know? So that's how everything started. And 
from the beginning of the work, um, we have impacted around like 120 women. So this is the number yeah. of women we have worked with in both countries. Yeah. In Kenya, I lived in 2017, was after a, a partnership with another organization operating there with children. And I lived there for a shorter period of time, but this was also a time like after we have tested things in India and realized what could work. So it was easier in a way to implement the same project in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And nowadays we have 30 women working in the organization in India and Kenya together. And from this 30, one third of them, so 10 women, <clears throat> they are actually paid monthly, which is also something that we believe a lot, which is this whole concept of universal basic income. Yeah, and, and uh, if I can add uh, in, in between, uh, because uh, I was there in Goa uh, do, doing the interviews for, for your project, and uh, what I learned from, from the kind of payment that you're doing uh, to them is that it actually works. It actually is helping them to uh, run their household. It sometimes helps them with, you know, uh, their husband's salary or something like that. Uh, they kind of mix and merge and, and help their kids in their education and stuff like that. So it's actually something that is working. Yes, thank you for, for sharing that. Exactly. You just did these amazing interviews with the women, you know, in different local languages and it was awesome for us to to have access to this. And exactly, this is really something that we believe that like it's not possible to think you are going to change stuff just by having people being paid on production, yeah. right? So uh, if we believe that just when we sell, we are able to pay them and only then they have money, this has an impact in terms of, yeah, how can someone really break a cycle, like a violent cycle, if they don't know how much money they will have the next month? Yeah. And this is how most of the women in these countries they live when we introduce this whole concept of like no you are going to be paid monthly you will perform something because they always do anyways they have yeah. value they are always taking care of the community they take care of the center which is the spaces we have in both countries where they work from where they have the sessions from where they do community events and everything so they are always at service and yeah. to me personally, I believe that everyone should have the right to be paid just for being who they are. But that's a little bit very um, progressive. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so let's just stick to, you know, these women still performing some kind of activity that brings value to this community yeah. and to our organization. Yeah. And what we have observed is that the whole process of confidence grows after a couple of months being paid because they have never experienced financial stability before in their lives ever yeah. they yeah. always were afraid that something is going to happen and yeah they live day by day you know so they do work today tomorrow this week so they can pay the rent and it's always this struggle and if you live like that all the time especially as a woman especially raising kids and stuff like that how can you possibly have room to think about breaking a cycle of violence you know yeah. or investing your money or, or on something else or starting your own business it's yeah. not possible and and it's amazing to see what doing this in the past almost three years that we started has um, created, you know, in their lives, in the lives of their families. And, this, and and I feel very, very, very proud that we do that. Yeah. Um, I was, I was just thinking about what you said uh, about the mental health thing that you started for those women, um, just trying to bring in like the, like an Indian perspective in this, the, uh, like what I saw when I was in, um, in in the west in in england uh, 
is that there is a difference between the way the society in India works and the way the society in UK works. So there's a, a, a lot less family involvement in uh, in UK and there's a lot more in India. And I, for myself, um, thought that this was one of the basic reasons why uh, you don't need a lot of mental health, um, um, you know, to kind of help uh individuals out because there's already a lot of help around you and you you have um, a, a lot more people to talk about and to have discussions and um, you know if you're going through something you can at least speak about that to someone else and that I found to be lacking at least in um, extremely developed societies uh, like like the UK. Um, the other point that, that uh, I was making was you, when you went uh, when you came to India, I think it was a completely different world that we were living in. Uh, social media was on its rise, and we were uh, we were trying to have um, communities, and there were lots and lots of uh, hostels and stuff like that, and people were interacting with each other. Um, over the period of time, uh, and especially uh, since and after COVID, uh, that has taken a, a drop like social media has turned from being uh, a much more inclusive and and a much more friendly kind of environment to being a much more um environment which is which tends to change um human behavior or, or human modification how much do you think that affected uh, uh the project in uh in in any way if it did or or um motivations or anything like that like progression what what how it it should go and how um it's it's kind of going with the uh, with the instability at times which at that point in time wouldn't have happened because people were much more um having having some sort of um uh reciprocity yeah uh, uh, if if i have to find a word for it yeah, you mean especially in the context of social media, right? Yeah. The rising of social media in this. Um, I would say that for us, for the, especially for the beginning of this work, it was crucial to count mm. on social media. Yeah. It was the only way um, I had to explain people and translate what was going on there. And get support because the support had to come from the outside, right? Yeah. I didn't know anyone in India. And most of the people that supported us were people that I knew personally from Brazil and people that I ended up meeting in the US mm -hmm. during the time that I was living there. So we relied a lot on that. And the impact of social media on our lives, especially in the life of our organization, especially in the uh, first years, uh, was also very big in terms of volunteers. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. operate basically with a lot of volunteers. So our goal is that whenever we have to pay something, this money is mostly gone to India and to Kenya. Mm -hmm. So we prioritize that in our organization and not with overhead costs. And it was the main way how we found people supporting our work by working for free for us. So yeah. everyone taking care of social media itself and trying to get funding and sales and uh, nowadays even like impact and uh, management of the organization itself, everyone came through social media pretty much. Yeah. So it had a massive impact. And what I feel that especially before COVID that was very stable and we were growing and was amazing and very helpful and what we experienced after covid times and i would say more precisely in the past one and a half years with this rise of um, conflict and other issues going on in the whole world things are becoming way more difficult for us uh, yeah. in social media you know because there is always something else coming up that is perceived as an emergency Mm -hmm. more urgent than gender equality in Indian Kenya. You know, mm -hmm. even though I believe that it is an extremely urgent topic, 
we are sometimes in the same space as a war, you know, or that a very big protest going on. And this makes it quite tough for us nowadays to rely simply on social media. So we have to kind of vary a little bit the ways how we promote the work we do. Mm -hmm. And I think um, also with the, with the rise of social media, I think we are also being dictated the kind of uh, things or topics that we need to talk about. And, Somehow, I think, uh, but this is a very personal opinion that um, that colonization is not not dead yet. It's it's just uh, moved on uh, into different different ways. And um, the more uh, I, I I tend to go into these topics, uh, the more I go into this rabbit hole. I see that governments, uh, even like in India or anywhere else, are turning into uh, the same like colonizers and but but they have a different head a different mask and different people um but at the end the idea is still the same it's not different um uh, so yeah so um i think like what what else i i would have to ask you about was um you obviously come from from brazil um and you are now living in Germany. There's a huge difference of culture. There's a huge difference of past. And I think there's a lot more in the past of um, places like the, um, South America or Africa or even Australia or any any other place. There's We are being taught a very limited past of every single country or every single continent. And I think that we as humans have had a very diverse and, and you know, different kind of past that, that we just uh, don't know about. How much do you think that indigenous past of, of Brazil um, or, or anywhere else in the world uh, will have an impact on, on the world in the coming few years? Because it seems like it's all, uh, you know, it's like the cycle, it's going round and we are going back to the ancestral um ideas of of what it meant to be a human yeah i don't know if i if i think it will or if i hope uh i think it's more that i hope that indigenous traditions and culture they will come back and have a big impact and influence in the world in the next years um i see a very big interest on on this kind of cultures and on this whole knowledge, you know, from medicines into way of living and yeah, different aspects, you know, even regarding like how uh, indigenous people, they raise children, you know, how they interact yes. with nature and stuff like that. I think there is also this very big boom, the same as India had with yoga, you yes. know, that's outside, everyone had this very big boom of, yeah, we want to take this knowledge and Catch spread around it. the world. Yeah. Exactly. And and it had a very big influence in the whole world as we experience today. I think I see the same with indigenous cultures and especially in the context of plant medicine, which I think it's very, it's, it's still very positive. Also, when you talk to indigenous people, they mentioned that this is one of their main ways to make people understand why is it so important to preserve nature why is it so important to keep you know the forest and to preserve this way of living i just think that we have to again be very careful of how this is being done how responsibly this is being done you know and yeah. finding like responsible sources to learn all those things from because it's a very uh, fine line to walk on if you if you go to uh too far into the extreme of it and if you just see it as not as medicine just just some drug that just um you know turns you into something else or whatever it's very difficult to to um to manage it if if that happens with it Exactly. And the way how they usually explain, especially the 
the people I have contact with, you know, that are my friends and that are the, the people that teach me on this subject, let's say, is that for them, everything is spiritual, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just about the medicine. It's about everything. It's about the music. It's the way how they go hunting. It's the way how they raise their children. So especially in Western societies where people have a hard time connecting with their spirituality because they connect the spirituality to religion mm -hmm. and to dogmas. And that's a whole Cycle, other yeah. aspect you know, of, yeah. you know, of colonization or, or this whole fear of, um, yeah, having their ideas tamed somehow. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the indigenous culture, it's, it's very tricky if people don't have any any kind of belief in this realm yeah. right yeah. because it's just like how uh to them this is not um this is not something they're just for performance you know yeah. it's not something just like to treat uh your performance and make you access something better and it's not um yeah done just for personal development in the sense of yeah it's performance i i don't have another word to use it yeah so that's what i find a bit tricky still with this this topic at the moment but yeah i really hope people become more interested and not only interested in the sense of themselves like i want to experience this and i want to live this yeah. but uh connected in the sense of like how can i contribute for them to have also more you know to have more abundance to reach their goals to spread their message because to them this is also very important and that i hope we don't stop just in the personal aspect of connecting with indigenous cultures yeah but, but i also think that in in cities um so our cities are, are basically becoming more and more like open prisons where um yeah, you know, uh, people just don't know how to how to expand and and go out. And nature is tamed in 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 certain ways, and you cannot have this excessive growth of of nature and wild forests where um, anything and everything is growing with abundance. Uh, and and what I, I saw in Nepal in in Vietnam in the past couple of months is that. Uh, when when all these people from the West are coming to um, certain uh, backward or, or third world kind of areas, um, they are they are enforcing their ideals upon the people of that of that place, and that seems to change what they want or what they think of, and it's becoming more and more of a commercial thing uh, than how it was before, which was more of a uh, there was more of a spiritual or or a, or a more of a cultural aspect to it, which is kind of wiped off um, through that. Um, do you do you see that happening? Yes, definitely. And I think, like I said, this whole exercise of decolonizing yourself and your views and the way how you interact with people that are from a different culture than yours is very tricky. It is indeed very tricky because yes. I also understand that sometimes people, they they need something. They need basic resources. They need to make sure they are producing something that others want to buy. So, of yes. course, we we also depend on this influence. I'm not saying that, you know, we will never listen to what's being searched and what people want to and all of those kind of things. But I, I guess it's just this aspect of going with eyes of someone that is also willing to learn things yeah uh, that we are not having it you know i feel that very often it's this one way thinking that is ah, i'm going there and i expect uh this place to be clean to the standards that i live yeah. my life you know in yeah. my apartment and that people also behave in a certain way and that yes. people don't try to take advantage of me because of money. This is a whole topic that like I could do a whole <laughs> podcast with this like white fragility in terms of being ripped off in trips, you know, <laughs> because of 50 cents. Like, yeah. honestly. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's this it's this whole <laughs> expectation, you know, that yeah, people need to um, treat you with a certain way, you know, and with a certain code, and that you have to experience things in in one way. And and I think also another thing we try to do a lot in Project Tres is to create programs where we uh, have the women teaching people things, mm -hmm. you know, and so they do cooking classes, for example, is a very um, popular activity that we do Ria, nowadays. Ria, right. Exactly. Ria, yeah. Sharmila, she also does it. So we receive foreigners and then they go and then the women are the teachers teaching them how to cook traditional Indian food and they eat together and mm -hmm. all of those things. And another activity we started doing a couple of years back as well is Farida. She takes people to the local markets and she mm -hmm. teaches them how to shop without using plastic. So mm -hmm. like how can she can people interact with the local uh, stands, you know, in a way that like they don't yeah. give them plastic and this whole thing, because this is also like a, something that Farida promotes, you know, she, she even had a time she used to go around the shops and say that the government would charge them fees and fines if they kept yeah. using plastic bags yeah. and, and tricking everyone in the market. Um, so yeah, it's something she, she really likes doing it. And um, yeah, so doing more of this, you know, putting people, local mm -hmm. people at the center of things in this position of being the ones giving the knowledge and not the ones being educated somehow. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, I think it's it's like uh, the last uh, couple of questions uh, before we end this, but um, I think we, I mean, um, you are working obviously in in Germany. Um, how are you perceived as a Brazilian working in Germany? Uh, of course, there's a lot a lot of the uh, you know uh, things in between. But but I also understand that it's not that simple for 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 someone like you to be working in in Germany, and there will be a lot of uh, politics involved, uh, a lot of bureaucracy involved, a lot of. Um, laws and regulations because i i experienced it um and and i i i hate it uh but but it's a lot of of uh problems or or hurdles that are set in front of us so that we um basically do not succeed uh in in that place or or basically um keep one step backwards uh or, or work something which is um kind of the jobs for Indians or kind of the jobs for, for uh, you know, anyone else. How is it for you? It's still a constant learning process. And we are registered as an organization in Germany since 2020, which was COVID times. Mm -hmm. And I still feel like I have no clue about how this whole thing works sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, like to every day I have to run and operate an organization here. There is at least two times in a day that I'm like, I have no clue how to sort things out. Yeah. And of course, this is really exhausting and beyond the whole bureaucracy and the whole challenge navigating structures that are already in place another thing that yeah. i find very tough is the fact that the way how we run our organization is also not necessarily a very european way mm -hmm. you know i don't mm -hmm. focus so much in very big impact numbers our goal is not to exponentially grow things in a certain way and even in terms of how we prepare our papers and our brochures and our official documents. It's not the way how we ideally want to do this, you know, because at the end of the day, I am someone, I am from Brazil. I was educated in Brazil. I work for the interest of women in India and Kenya. So I don't want to turn this organization into um, something that doesn't translate us 
that doesn't yeah. translate my essence and yeah. all these women's essence and this to start the conversation you know also this whole female way of leading stuff you know that is way more about uh thinking how we can do things in a way that supports everyone and that everyone can grow rather than uh, this more masculine mentality. there's a lot less corporatism and there's, there's a lot more feeling and there's a lot more emotion when when it, it's coming from a, a woman's uh, perspective that that obviously i see uh in the ngo that, that it's people don't speak the corporate language people speak from exactly. their heart uh, it's it's more about love it's more about affection towards one another uh, it's more about having diversity and open-mindedness when it comes to uh, so many different cultures and and the women are from so many different religions as well uh, and when I ask them this question that there's a lot of hatred uh, outside and in media and there's a lot of um, politics around religion in India and they say that this is like a small bubble for us. Like when, once we are in this place, once we are in Project Thress, then everything outside just shuts off because here we can be truly ourselves. And that is, I think, the most important part about, about the project, you know, um, that I saw over there. Yeah. And I think like if we boil down one thing that we try to do with our work is to stop violence you know yes. it boils down to this like stop perpetrating violence and seeing violence as a way of getting things yes. and i see that systems of making something look successful and getting funding and getting opportunities and you have to structure things in a certain way they are yeah. very violent yeah you know they yeah. they reproduce models of violence in my point of view Mm -hmm. So to me, it is still very important to stay truth to this essence of like, how can we build this, this whole thing, not just for the, for the women out there, yeah. but for ourselves, for the volunteers, for the way how we get the money and the way how we sell what we do in a non-violent way. Yes. You know, and this is the, this is the process we have been navigating um no <laughs> i think i want to uh end this with with uh a couple of questions i think uh first of them would be um what do you think of the world that you're living in uh coupled with what is reality for you pretty simple question <laughs> um I think the world is complex. That's that's the best I can I can describe, I would say. Um and I feel that whenever we we have the impression we are getting closer to to some clarity, mm. um things are constantly changing and this again it's not necessarily that clear anymore and I think this has a connection with reality right like I think it's so complicated to describe reality reality mm -hmm. to me is to stay connected as much as I can with the resources I have right now to what makes me feel myself mm -hmm. you know even though there is a lot of bad things going on and frustrating stuff there is also a lot of good I feel mm -hmm. you know and there is a lot of movement towards making things in a different way mm -hmm. so yeah my my definition of what we are living right now is just complex you know and in terms of reality i think to me what reality means is to stay connected to authenticity this is mm -hmm. what it means to me um because the more you can stay authentic to your essence to yourself i think the more you can experience a sense of reality 
for your own self, right? Like it's, in my point of view, it's impossible to define what reality is in a, in a bigger realm. So I would just say, yeah, in a very personal level. What, and, what did, yeah. what did, um, a psychedelic experiences teach you about the nature of reality? Yeah, that there is way more to to life and to our essence as beings than what we can see and what we can perceive with our eyes with scientific explanation and things like that i guess this is the main thing i have learned from from my past experiences you know it's not because you have not been seeing this here now that this mm -hmm. doesn't that this is not real um so yeah i guess that's my my main learning good um with that i think we should end the interview and thank you so much for being here and having this talk podcast <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much you. as well ash you know we always have very interesting conversations and yeah it's a pleasure maybe we we talk again in the future about other topics yeah <laughs>